Well, thank you all so much for being here. We really um, are so happy to be hosting the Newburyport Literary Festival online with A Mighty Blaze. My name is Leslie Hendrickson and I'm on the steering committee of the Newburyport Festival. Just a couple of things before we get started. We're using the webinar format, so you are not going to appear on the screen as you do in a meeting format. We will be taking questions. Um, you can put those questions in the Q&A thread down at the bottom of your screen. The panel is going to last about 45 minutes and we'll do those questions at the end. In the chat, you'll find a link to our website, which is more information about the festival and our authors and all the other events we're having today and on May 3rd. There are also going to be links to our independent bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky in Newburyport. They have books from all our authors and we encourage you to support them or your local independent bookshop. Again, we really thank you for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to um, have you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris Collender, who is the moderator for this panel. Thank you again. Thank you, Leslie. I hope everyone has something to eat while they are um, listening, because we're going to be talking about my two favorite subjects today, books and food. My name is Chris Coleander. I live in Vermont, and I am a writer, an avid reader, and a home cook. And I am excited to talk again with these four wonderful authors about um, food in books. Um, we all got together last October and at the Boston Book Festival, and we got together again. And um, so uh, we're not doing a repeat. This is totally new. So this is going to be really fun. Um, but before we begin, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to Vicki Hendrickson, Jennifer Entwistle, Leslie Hendrickson, and the hardworking committee of the Newburyport um, Literary Festival, so this can still happen. Um, that festival is one of the highlights of my spring, and I was so disappointed um, when it was canceled, but this is the next best thing, and in some respects, maybe better, because people from all over the country and the world are able to see us and all these great authors, and um, for some people who weren't able to come to Newburyport for the day. So this is just fantastic. So thank you to everyone who made this happen. So I'm going to give a short introduction to today's authors. Jenna Blum is a New York Times and number one international best-selling author of the novels, Those Who Save Us and The Storm Chasers. In her latest book, The Lost Family, Jenna seamlessly weaves a story between World War II Germany and New York City in the 1960s, where at the center is Masha's, a rival restaurant to the Russian Tea Room. It is a vivid portrait of a marriage in two families, one of grief, but also one of deep love. And most recently, Jenna is the founder with author Caroline Levitt of the website, A Mighty Blaze, Spring and fall are the biggest times of the year for the publishing industry. And Jenna and Caroline are helping to spread the word about books that are coming out this spring to readers. Almighty Blaze is also a co-sponsor of this festival and are streaming all the sessions live on Facebook and will be available afterwards. If you missed a session and you want to go and watch that, you can go there. So big thank you, Jenna, from me as a reader for doing all you're doing to champion books. <laughs> So our next author is Ramin Ganeshram, is a veteran journalist and is a celebrated food columnist who has been awarded seven Society of Professional Journalists Awards for her work and an IACP Cookbook of the Year Award. A professionally trained chef, Ramin is the author of several cookbooks, as well as the book we're going to talk about today, The General's Cook which traces the story of President George Washington's personal chef, Hercules, who could be called this country's first celebrity chef. While he was famous for his cooking and ruling the White House kitchen, Hercules was enslaved in a city where most Black Americans were free. He harbors secrets, including the fact he was learning how to read, and he soon finds himself trapped by his circumstances. Now we turn to 16th century Italy and Crystal King's historical novel, The Chef's Secret. Crystal's first novel, Feast of Sorrow, was listed as a must read in the Massachusetts Book Awards. She has taught classes in writing, creativity, and social media at several universities, including Harvard Extension School, Boston University, and Grub Street. In her newest book, Crystal takes us to Renaissance Italy, where she details the mysterious life of 
Bartolomeo Scappi, a real legendary chef to several popes and author of one of the best-selling cookbooks of all time, and his nephew Giovanni, who sets out to discover his late uncle's secrets. And last but not least, Louise Miller, I like to say she's a pastry chef by day and a novelist by night. The late Bloomers Club returns to the imaginary town of Guthrie, Vermont, where her debut novel, The City Baker's Guide to Country Living, also takes place. And her latest book, Nora, the proprietor of the Guthrie Diner, and her filmmaker sister, Kit, are willed a farmhouse with a plot of land that is being eyed by a big box store. This book has a little bit of love, a little bit of mystery, a missing dog, and lots and lots of cake baking. And in the end, Nora discovers the real definition of home. So before we start talking about the books, I just kind of wanted to check in with all of you because food during this time seems to be quite a topic of conversation because everybody is cooking from home. Have you started your sourdough sponge? Have you named it? How many pots of beans have you cooked? Um, how many books have you read? <laughs> I've done all of the above. Um, how are you doing during these times? And Crystal, I will start with you. Oh, I thought that I would write a lot during these times, but I think I'm not alone in the writing world and this is just a tough time to have focus. Um, so I have been cooking and baking a lot more. My husband is um, the chef and I'm the baker and that has worked out really well for everything except our waistlines. Um, mm -hmm. But we were lucky enough to get some, some flour and some yeast um, early on and so I've been making um, uh, all sorts of like s snacky cake things and rice crispy treats and um, and we've been making pasta. We make we've been making a lot of Italian pasta and foods um, that are good. We also um, one of the things that's really cool is there's a lot of companies that only sold to restaurants, um, a lot of food vendors, and now they're selling directly to the consumer. So it's been really exciting because we actually found a duck farm and we were able to get duck from this company, tastyduck.com, and we were able to order duck and we have like duck at home for dinner. It's awesome and I love it. So we've been um, maybe exploring food a little more than we normally do with a super busy, crazy routine. I want to go to your house. <laughs> <laughs> Ramin, what about you? Um, well, so um, in my day job now, I'm um, I direct a history museum. I'm the executive director of a history museum. And so I've re been really busy getting the museum essentially online. Um, and what we found is that our food waste programming, which is also something we normally used to do, but we wound up doing it because of my background, um, is incredibly popular. So we ha we've been doing some really interesting um, videos, like a history happy hour, which is vintage cocktails. Um, and my expertise is obviously the 18th century. So I've been writing a lot of 18th century recipes for people, which um, they're surprisingly doing and tagging us on Facebook, which is amazing. Um, at home, though, my husband and daughter are really happy because they think I'm a short order chef. Um, <laughs> actually not, but you know, I thought I was trying a little better than that, but apparently I've become a short order chef. So I'm taking a lot of individual orders, including a lot of baking, which is not my love. Uh, I'm no Louise Miller, but you know, I do my best. So. And Jenna, you're so busy with a mighty blaze, but how are you doing during this time? Are you finding time to cook or, or not? <laughs> Thank you. I actually did a lot more cooking before the pandemic when I was procrastinating on what I was writing. Um, that's usually my go-to procrastination is like procrastinate baking, you know, procrastinate cooking. And then because of COVID, we started The Blaze so that we could get the word out to readers about writers whose book tours have been canceled by COVID. And now I'm working like a 12 to 14 hour day with my team of 16 writer creative volunteers. So I don't have as much time to bake. But I will say that um, I took a break for Easter and went out and put eggs all around the city of Boston. And I had some chocolate eggs and some malted milk eggs left over. And so yesterday I put them in a big bag and smashed them all up with a hammer and made chocolate chip cookies out of them or like chocolate malted egg cookies out of them. And that is for my mailmen. Because oh, no. guys, you know, they work so hard with their masks on and they're so unassuming. So I made a big batch of chocolate chip cookies for them. Um, and I've only eaten like 25 or 26 cookies 
by now. So I'm ahead of the game. We're all going to gain the COVID-15, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, and Louise, you make your living as a professional cook. Are you finding, are you, are you working? Are you writing more? How are you doing? Yeah, so I'm not working and um, I've been off work since the 16th of March. And it's really interesting for me because I never, ever cook at home. My partner does all the cooking. And I obviously, after a day of baking at work, I don't rush home to make any baked goods. But I have been baking at home and it's been a real pleasure, actually. Um, I try to keep it to like two projects a week. But, um, but I think everything is... This, our sense of time is so strange now and everything is it just I don't know about you guys but it feels kind of like one big day so baking <laughs> is so satisfying because it has a beginning and an end and it has something delicious at the end and so I'm really appreciating um just that practice and um and writing I I make myself sit down in front of the computer like Monday through Friday um, for a set amount of hours and everything I'm writing feels terrible <laughs> but um, but it feels good to be showing up for it um, so yeah so it's, it's a mixed bag yeah yeah okay so let's get into the books um, three of the novels that we are talking about today take place in a different time period and we are truly living in a historical time right now. Um, Ramin, you are a chef and you created this world in Philadelphia, both for the research on the time period, as well as the food of the era. So talk a little bit about how you approach researching both the history and the food when writing this novel. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, especially since my character, Hercules was a, a real person, um, just as Crystal's characters are were real people. Um, in my case, because my main character was an enslaved person, uh, what we knew about him, what we know about him, is fairly limited, right? And so, um, the thing is, well, I should I should preface that by saying we know quite a bit about him for an enslaved person, but certainly not as much as you might know about a person who wasn't in that condition. So to research him. Obviously, I, I used all the material that I could find about him in particular, but I had to research the world around him more than anything so that he kind of could come into focus as the world was built behind him. Um, so that was down to everything from, um, you know, all the different types of people who lived in Philadelphia. I was really um, using the 1790 census of the city of Philadelphia very tightly. Um, you know, the political situation, the social situation. I was lucky enough to have a map of the city from that time, so I could use that in great detail. Um, I found a weather, uh, like Buff, who, who recorded the weather in Philadelphia for 40 years, including the time period of my book. So even the weather in the book is accurate. Um, but in terms of the recipes and the food, which was really the, the greatest pleasure for me to research, I was really lucky in that I developed a, a relationship with the historic foodway staff at Colonial Williamsburg, um, at Mount Vernon, George Washington's Mount Vernon. And I live in New England, so um, I'm very lucky in that there are a lot of historic sites where there is heritage cooking going on um, for a good part of the year. So I was able to kind of, for five or six years, immerse myself in uh, watching people cook in the time, in the time period, um, and in some cases participating. So there was a lot of archival research, um, and there was a lot of hands-on research as well. Oh, great. Um, Crystal, your book takes place in 1577 Italy. So talk a little bit about how you discovered the story of the Pope's cook, because this is a it is a true story. Um, and the immense research you must have done on the period and the food that was prevalent in those days. Um, I, when I read the book, I sat with my phone because there were so many things when they were having their feasts that I had no idea what they were. So how, talk about your um, research process in writing your book. So the, um, the story itself wasn't, isn't necessarily true, but all of the people, I think it's like 90% of the characters in the book were actual people. 
Um, and I tried to stay true to what we knew about the people, but if there were any instances that um, we didn't know certain things, I got to fill in the gaps. I look at it like I'm connecting the dots between what we know and what we don't know, and I get to just fill it all in in between and color it all up. Um, I, I started with this book, which I showed a little bit ago. This is the um, translation of the 1570 cookbook. It was a best-selling cookbook for almost 200 years after it was published in 1570. There's a thousand recipes in it. Um, and there's all these menus too. And there's a lot of information from the translator about um, who he was and where he worked and um, what, who he worked for. So we, we know very little about Scoppy himself. We know who his employers were, which were several cardinals and several popes. We know um, he was born in Dumenza, a city in, north, in northern Italy. Um, we know that he lived in Bologna, Milan, um, Ven Venice, um, and Rome, and had at least traveled a bit because he knew about foods from all over Italy. And uh, all the rest we don't, oh, we have his will. So I knew that he had a sister named Katerina, and he had um, a, um, uh, I, I knew who her husband was and I knew and we know that he had an apprentice named Giovanni who was his nephew but I kept thinking I, I discovered him when I was writing my first novel Feast of Sorrow um, about this ancient Roman gourmand Apicius and when you're researching culinary history through time it's not like you can pick up a book just about that person um, unless they happen to be super famous and maybe more recent but there's not a whole book on Apicius, who is the gourmand that I wrote about. And there's not a whole book on Scopi. I can't just research their lives. But you get these compendiums of food history. And then I, I kept seeing Scopi's name. And I thought, I'm going to have to find out about this cookbook. So I got the cookbook. And then I, I realized nobody knows who he is. Nobody really knows much about him. And uh, I kept thinking, well, if we don't know much about him, what was his life like? We know that he didn't marry, or, or at least he didn't, um, he didn't have a, ch a son that he left anything to because he let in his will, he left it to Giovanni. And I kept thinking, well, was he a workaholic? What if he loved someone? And what if he loved someone he shouldn't have loved? And I kept noodling over all of that. And then the story just sort of came out of this whole thing. I also spent a lot of time over dinner with my husband and I just throw ideas at him. and. I would say in all of my books, he has been somebody who said, well, what about that? And then it just becomes this seed that takes hold and, and I work with that. Um, so it's a lot of research. I research the place, I research the food, I cook the recipes, um, I research the people around Scopi, much like Ramin was saying, um, we don't know much about the characters. We have to look at everybody around them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Jenna, the lost family is no exception in terms of research, but you had to capture a certain sense of place in two different eras, New York City in the 1960s, as well as Germany during World War II. So talk about your research process. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Chris. So when I invented the menus for the lost family, because the book has menus um, for its restaurant, Masha's, I was trying to create a menu for its protagonist, Peter, who is a German Jewish chef. And so I knew that I needed to create items that were German Jewish comfort food. And since that part of the book is set in 1965, everything also had to be brown and like drenched in whiskey and preferably able to be set on fire, which if it's drenched on whiskey, you can pretty easily do. So I, spent a lot of time like being immersed in cookbooks like I just happened to have these cookbooks just sitting next to me which is one of the great things about being at home. Um, one of them was the Betty Crocker New Picture Cookbook which I adore which has the best I mean, Louise will disagree with me on this, but it has a, an excellent <laughs> high crust recipe in it. Um, and also a lot of handy era specific things like in 1965, instructions to wives to greet your husbands at the door after their long day of work with a chilled glass of fruit or vegetable juice. So <laughs> I was kind of combing through these era cookbooks to create Peter's menus for Masha's. Um, and at the time, my guy at the time came downstairs and said, you know, since 
the book has a restaurant in it, it would be great if it also had actual menus with actual food items. And then I spent the rest of the summer creating everything on the menu and kitchen testing it. So things like brisket Wellington and a variation on chicken Kiev and Brussels sprout salad with, you know, cherries and blue cheese, like everything is like extremely unhealthy and, and really yummy. And for the German part of the book, I hit up my friend Christiana, who obligingly sent me recipes from her mother's German cookbooks from the 20s. Um, so I had a lot of recipes for rotkraut and sauerkraut and chutneys and elderberrin that I also tried my best to reconstruct. So it was such an amazing thing to connect with somebody else's childhood memories through researching this book, um, and also to connect with a very glamorous era that I'd heard about from my parents, but had never lived through myself, that sort of swinging 60s era. And there might have been a little bit of whiskey consumption while I was creating the recipes as well. <laughs> and some flames. And many flames, <laughs> many flames, yes, at parties for the book. Uh, so Louise, um, because you make yourself, you make your living as a chef, what, when you started writing, was that a natural progression for you to add food into your books? Or oh, yeah, totally. It's, um, I mean, I, one of the reasons I really wanted to write um, my first novel was really like, I love the culture of being in a kitchen. Like, I just, I love that world. And um I've been baking for over 25 years and um, have, you know, spent the majority of my adult life in a professional kitchen. And uh, yeah, I loved, I love all the details and the textures of the things that I do. And, and kitchens are full of very funny characters always. And um, so, yeah, it was just a world that I was excited to share. And it was fabulous. Uh, like just being able to write about something I knew really well. Um, I have no formal training as a writer. I didn't, you know, go to school and study writing, just read a lot of books. And so, um, so especially writing that first draft, I can't imagine adding research on top of that. It was hard enough figuring out like how to write a novel. Um, this is a question for all of you. Who are some of your writing influences, um, food or otherwise? as authors is there someone that you that you rely on that's interesting i i really, <laughs> i read really widely and lately i most of the books that i read i think people would be surprised i think a lot of times like readers assume that writers only read books that are like theirs and i tend to read kind of all over the place um so like you know, so I'm always, I hate answering this question because I'm just like, people are gonna be like, wow, she thinks she writes like Ann Patchett. And no, I do not <laughs> write like Ann Patchett, but she's my hero. Um, Cause she's so compassionate um, with her characters. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, it, it, it's an interesting question, but um, for me, Ann Patchett, I love Jojo Moyes. I, I really, I just love anyone that, treats their characters really humanely and lets them be whole people. Um, and then I'm a sucker for someone to, to bring some humor into their work, but yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to weigh in? I think for me, um, I love food, food writing as well. Um, I read very widely and all sorts of crazy stuff and I actually would like nothing better than to sit up with a fantasy novel and just dive in for a while. But I do read a lot of food writing as well. And, um, and MFK Fisher is probably one of my big influences. Um, she really started the whole genre of, of food writing as journalism and um, inspired a lot of food authors, uh, uh, people who write about food. Um, and she just ha knows how to have beautiful turns of phrases and she describes food in such an incredible luscious way. Um, and I also really love Italo Calvino. He's somebody that I'm trying to read his entire catalog, which is immense. Um, and he was one of Italy's most celebrated authors and he has just beautiful novels. Um, Invisible Cities is probably my favorite. Um, and it's every, every word is just gorgeous when he writes, so. Jenna or Ramin, do you wanna weigh in? You don't have to. Well, well. <laughs> What I would say is that, and you know, I it, the thing I really love to read, which is bizarre, is uh, mysteries. 
I really like them. And Louise Penny is my most favorite, favorite um, mystery author. Um, and, and very much as, as, Louise, as Louise has said, it's because she treats her characters with great compassion. Um, I noticed recently, um, without no, realizing it, in that she kind of inadvertently spends a lot of time talking about food and her mysteries, because there's a bistro that's kind of a central part of this little town called Three Pines. And when she talks about what people are eating, even if it's cooked in someone's house or cooked in this bistro or drinking, um, I only, it just only occurred to me recently, she does it in great and beautiful details. So, um, but in terms of food writers, you know, uh, certainly MFK Fisher, absolutely. But um, I really like Calvin, Calvin Trillin, who is often not thought of necessarily as a food writer, but he does actually do a lot of food writing. Um, and I particularly like the things that he writes where he focuses on the food of New York City, particularly the Lower East Side, because I'm from New York City. I went to high school in the Lower East Side. Um, I always joke that I actually don't tell anybody, although I'm telling everybody, I don't love salmon as a fish. And I realized the reason why is because, right, exactly, Jenna. And I realized why is because I was blessed to grow up in New York City. And, and the, the, the salmon that I ate until I was probably 23 years old was lox, an amazing lox. And I love lox. And when I first had fresh salmon, I was like, ugh, what is this mess? I thought lox. So anyway, Calvin Trillin does a good job with those foods as well. So he's a favorite. Mm. Jenna? Thinking about this, um, hoping that, you know, I would be able to come up with an answer while my colleagues were talking. And I and oh, thank God, like I'm in my library so I can turn around <laughs> and be like, who are my influences? Because as soon as somebody asks me this question, my brain shorts out. I think in terms of sheer storytelling, the answer that I give that often surprises people is Stephen King, especially his early work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't read it for the horror aspect. I read it because the man really knows how to tell a story and he knows how to do beautiful portraiture of people who are under extreme duress. So of course, I've been thinking a lot about King during this pandemic, one of my favorite books of all time, my top three is The Stand. Um, and so I've been sort of having a love-hate war with myself about do I read The Stand again as a sort of a primer to how to survive the pandemic or do I stay away from it because it seems redundant. So there's that. Um, in terms of writing, when I was researching The Lost Family, it really brought me to, I am a little embarrassed to say, the first food writing of my life. When I was creating my chef character, Peter, I started out by reading chef memoirs. So I began with Anthony Bourdain, as one should. I already had all of his cookbooks, which read like memoirs anyway, and he's so profane and so funny, lives forever in his words. And I progressed from there, like all over the place, to Marcus Samuelson, to Julia Child, to Jacques Pepin. Um, and I just, I love that chefs as Louise pointed out, are such colorful characters and they think and they live out of the box. And it had never occurred to me before I started reading these memoirs that that meant they would probably be really good storytellers too. So if you have not yet embarked upon your food writing reading, I would strongly suggest it because it's highly entertaining stuff, although it will make you hungry. <laughs> well, this sort of leads into my next question because it's um, getting to be graduation time and Mother's Day and Father's Day. And who are some tried and true cookbook authors out there that you would recommend um, for someone who's just starting out on their own or wants to kind of increase work on their repertoire in the kitchen? Who are some of those people out there? I am a Dory Greenspan super fan. Like I just worship her and her re her recipes are so well tested. I mean, she really does the work and I've never like, you know, followed a recipe of hers that didn't come out perfectly like the way she suggests. And, um, and she loves cookies and I love cookies. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I feel like we're kindred spirits. Um, I, if you're into um, food history, Francine Sagan has some really great cookbooks that are wonderful for like the home chef. She has one on ancient Rome called, um, oh shoot, I'm totally blanking on the name, but it's, there's, she, it's oh, The Philosopher's Kitchen. And then she also has one that's um, set in um, essentially the Renaissance time period in England called Shakespeare's Kitchen. Um, and so she's somebody that is really great for accessing food history. And if you're interested in Italian history, 
um, or just Italian cooking in general, Marcella um, Hazen or Marcella Hazen is somebody that a lot of people are familiar with or maybe at least have heard her name, but she is tried and true, just really incredible recipes. Every single recipe you make from her, one of her cookbooks will turn out amazing. Ramin, do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah, I, you know, there are two. I have to just tell you that I noticed um, the vintage editions of The Joy of Cooking. I realized when I went to culinary school, um, they read like culinary school textbooks, actually. And of course, um, you know, Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking as well. They read like culinary school t textbooks and all those really strong basics that you need to build upon are there. Um, I will say, with a full disclosure of bias, um, because I worked with her, um, the late, great Molly O'Neill, all of her books are, um, you know, the recipes are, t I know them because I did it myself for her with One Big Table. I worked with her on One Big Table for two years, tested and tested and tested again. Um, so they work and they are a wonderful catalog of American food culture over time. Um, and I would say that those, those are among my favorites, her work. Jenna, do you have a favorite? I do. I was, I, I'm never answering a question last again because I was going to say the joy of cooking. It was like the one cookbook I didn't have sitting next to me because I thought it was too grody to show on camera. <laughs> this is my copy of the joy of cooking. It's like totally stained from like 25 years of me cooking from it. It was the first cookbook my parents ever gave me as a gift. It has like you know, the burn mark in the back from when I set it on the burner. So it's like a really well-loved thing. The pages are like all falling out of it and they're all annotated. Do I, and I still use cookbooks. Like I don't try to cook from a screen generally, which is not just because I once dropped my iPad in the sink. It's because I actually <laughs> genuinely love cookbooks. So if you're talking about a starter cookbook, I definitely recommend The Joy of Cooking. I absolutely love it. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out also to this book that I go to all the time, which is called Table of Contents, which is a book of recipes by writers about what their favorite recipes are. So uh, I think it's produced by the book club cookbook did this fantastic thing um, and I have a recipe in here for my grandmother's Norwegian pudding that we eat at Christmas called Ruma grout that's probably called that because it actually looks like grout it's like flour and milk and butter and cinnamon and sugar it's like the ultimate comfort food that they used to give the pioneer women after they gave birth and purportedly they would have a bowl of ruma grout and spring up and go back to work in the field with the oxen. So there you go. But all of the recipes in this book have some family history attached to them. Mm, great. Um, okay, so I have a million questions for you and we have like 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go to the Q&A. We only have two questions there. So I'll see, hopefully this will work. Um, Louise, here's a question for you. Has the Hallmark Channel picked up City Baker to adapt for the TV screen? She it has, says it's going, it, that would be perfect. <laughs> it has not. I've had no film bites, um, much to my disappointment because I'm a real like movie junkie. And so um, I would love that. So if anyone knows anyone in Hollywood, uh, I'll send you my oh, email. Louise, I have someone for you to talk to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email you after this. I have someone oh, that'd be awesome. To. I love your book so much, so. Oh, look, deals are being made live. <laughs> um, uh, oh, so um, someone else named Jenna um, says, I'd like to know if any of these fabulous ladies have a favorite recipe in their book. That's a great question. Do any of you have a favorite recipe in your book? I know, Louise, you're... Um, your cake, which I, I would have made for the festival if we were here. I would have been wanting to try that. Yeah, it was funny. Um, so both of my books revolve around one particular baked item. And so both books include a recipe. And um, so the um, there's a burnt sugar cake in the Late Bloomers Club. And I actually had never made a burnt sugar cake when I set out to write it. I just loved how it sounded. And I was looking for like a very traditional Northern New England cake. Um, 
And so like everything in publishing, you know, you get an email that's like, oh, I really want to include that cake recipe. Could you give it to us like on Friday? And it's like Tuesday. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I had two bird sugar cake recipes and I made them both and I like hated them. They were really gross. They're really sweet and dry and like terrible. Um, so I'm very lucky that at my job, they let me usually make whatever I want, like nine times out of 10, the party will just say whatever the chef wants to do. And so that week everyone got burnt sugar cake because I had to like really furiously develop a recipe um, and in the end I really loved the recipe that is in the book um, but yeah it got created over the course of like three days. Oh. Anybody else have a favorite recipe? I do actually um, I send out recipes to readers on um, place cards that they can use as bookmarks for their books and I also have them posted on the website when I remember to do it which is sadly infrequently. Um, <laughs> I have a, a double German chocolate tort called a matcha tort that I like to put cherries on top and set on fire, which um, Crystal helped me with once at a party. And it was like very, very exciting to see all these bloom flames come shooting out of the cake. So the matcha tort recipe is one of the things that I give to readers. But my favorite recipe, honestly, is latkes. Peter has these latkes that he serves with beet dip and horseradish sauce. And although the beet dip is one that I invented myself and it's pink and it looks like unicorn food. So there's that. The latkes are my grandmother's recipe. And every time I serve them, people say, these are the best freaking latkes I ever ate. Um, so I'm especially fond of that recipe. Um, I actually have two cookbooks that people can download on my website, crystalking.com. And in it, I include some of the recipes that I still make all the time. Um, there's one from ancient Rome that my husband and I make, we make for dinner all the time. It's a 2000 year old recipe for fried chicken, or not fried chicken, but for chicken, um, roasted chicken. And it's made with fish sauce with garum. And, um, but it doesn't taste like fish. It just gives it a new mommy flavoring and that it's just delicious. And then there's um, a, cheap, a pumpkin cheesecake pie that I made that I, it's crazy that it's a 500 year old recipe and it's just incredible and delicious and yummy. And um, Louise actually has a recipe in the cookbook for the chef's secret for an apple galette um, basically, or it's an apple tart, um, a, 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 a crostata is what it is in Italian. And it's so good, it's so delicious. And I think that's the recipe that one, most of my readers end up making. Oh, and they love every, I get so many people that tell me they've made your pie, Louise. Oh, I love that, that's so yeah. fun. That was really fun developing. Uh, so Crystal sent me like kind of the original um, recipe and then I just tried to modernize it for the kitchen. It was really, really fun. I, I loved it too, which is always, um, I always consider myself my, you know, my, my first dining guest. Um, so that was, that was really fun that people have liked it. Or maybe do you have a favorite? Um, I would say that the one I really like, um, and I should say that there are no recipes in the current edition of the General's Cook, but it's coming out in paperback in November and it, all of the recipes that he cooks in the book are going to be in there, um, in the, in the after matter, in the appendix. Um, my favorite is for chocolate cream pie because people don't think of chocolate cream pie as an 18th century recipe, but it absolutely was. They made chocolate cream pie. So that's my favorite one because it surprises people. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I gotta have lunch after this. Okay, more questions. Now we're asking more questions. Um, uh, oh, this is a good one for all of you. What is your favorite meal? Mine's just popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> pizza and the first thing I'm going to do when the pandemic is over is I'm going to order five pizzas and I'm going to eat all the pizzas by myself at one time I seriously cannot wait and you guys I have to keep swallowing because you're making my mouth water talking about it. I was supposed to eat beforehand but I sort of forgot so you know yes I'm I'm starving thanks to your food thoughts I mean Crystal either either of you have a favorite meal <sighs> That's so difficult. I, Meal's hard. I, it's really hard. I have to say that um, what what tends to be my favorite is it's often very much in the era or in the moment, right? So right now, um, so I'm half Trinidadian, and I really 
am sucky at making roti and paratha and the, this like wonderful griddle bread that we eat with curry. And I can bake. I, I went to culinary school. I can make croissant from scratch. Can't make roti though. Don't know why. Um, really uh, a tribulation to my husband who's Irish American and thought, you know, but whatever, he loves Trinidadian food. So right now that's what I'm craving. In my mind right now, that's my most favorite thing because I can't go to Brooklyn and get any. <laughs> I think at the moment, that's what it is. Although a New York pizza though, you know, that's also right now, right? right. This is what I'm saying. I grew up in Jersey. I don't do, forgive me, I'm gonna insult half the people on this chat. I do not do Chicago deep dish pizza. I do floppy crust, bleed oil through the box pizza, practically <laughs> eaten standing up at a hole in the wall pizza joint like Ray's in the village, right? And no blotting, no blotting. The people oh, no. Who blot blotting with my mouth. <laughs> we have time That's for one more question, I think. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is there like a one question? question? Time for this. What, pardon me? No, no, go Chris, sorry. sorry. Oh, um, how much do you have to change a recipe to make it yours? Oh, well, for me, I would say that when you're working with historical recipes, it's really easy to, to have to change them to make them yours. I don't, I mean, because you have to figure out how to make them work in the first place, um, particularly with the ancient Roman recipes. Um, there's no, um, there's no measurements. There's just a description of what it is. And there might be some slight instruction on um, what you should, how you should put the food together. Scoppy is a little bit better. There's actually some measurements on some things, but it'll say like some cinnamon or a pinch of that. And you, you have to kind of adjust and figure out what that means. And they also had different concentrations for things that we wouldn't have. Like, for example, I don't know what their rose water really was like. Um, and we have rose essence and we have rose water now and but I don't know if the proportions are the same or anything like that. So um, I feel like every recipe that I recreate is my recipe because there's no way that I don't have a fire that I'm cooking all the food on. I don't, you know, so for me, I, 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 they just get to be mine, which is pretty cool. Um, we have just a couple of seconds left. Um, Jenna, I know we have a show and tell with you because you have your family cookbook. Do you have that right next to you? I do, actually. I do. I happen to have it family. with me. So this is my, <laughs> my family and friends cookbook, volume one from 19, started it in 1993. So when I was married, a child bride, I had my, when I was, you know, 13, haha. -ha. I had like my, you know, husband's recipes in there, my mom's recipes, like all of these like recipes I glued in over the years. Um, and I, so I've got like a ton of stuff in here that um, I cooked and then again, annotated. Like this is my recipe for my mom's like beef bourguignon with a picture of her that I cut out when we were still actually taking pictures, you know, like that we would get back from like the drugstore. There were actual photos. Um, so like this is, I now have a volume two, but this is kind of what my cooking life has looked like for I don't even know how many years that is and nobody tell me like 37 years or something um, and an homage to my mom today i'm wearing her favorite apron my mom hated cooking she hated it like so i grew up you know in the 70s watching her walk around the house with her cigarette hanging out of her mouth and this apron that says bitch, bitch. <laughs> and it might be my favorite thing i've ever worn to a panel so you know thanks COVID, for letting us <laughs> come home so that i can do that there are some things that we can do. Um, we have two minutes left, so I'll go to one quick question. Um, let's see. Um, uh, well, I'll just ask you one of my questions. Um, why do you think food and books is so popular? I gravitate toward them. Anytime I see a novel on the shelf, I'll pick it up. Um, is it comfort? We all have to eat. Familiarity? We, all, we do all have to eat. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, really food-centered books. Uh, I think a lot of people have an interest in um, in cooking. I mean, I, I have found like a lot of people, like for books that are contemporary, like people have a curiosity. There's so much food entertainment now on television. Like, um, so I think people have 
kind of a fantasy. Like even my doctor was like, I've always dreamt about being a pastry chef. And I'm like, you're a doctor. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think there's a curiosity about the world. And, and like Crystal said, we all eat. It's, it's so much of how we were brought up. It's our childhoods. It's, you know, it's our cultures that we grew up in. And um, yeah, there's food is, has contained so much emotion and so much um, information. Um, so it's, it's a fun kind of tool, I think, in stories. And it's part of all our rituals too. It's in our religion, it's in our um, daily, you know, meet, we, we meet with friends, we often meet over food, we, you know, it's our like memories, it's, it, it's really ingrained in our rituals, our holidays, so people find it comforting. I think that's why everyone's baking right now. A, not everybody has anything. People don't have anything to do, but baking feels comforting. It feels, um, it's nourishing. It's, it's warm. It's, it's, it makes you feel good, even if it's only for a little while. You know, I, I have to say that I think because it's so universal, obviously we all have to eat to live. Um, it becomes an opportunity I have found as a journalist and then, and then a cookbook writer and a, now a novelist. It gives people this opportunity to talk about themselves that they might not otherwise take. Right? People can be reticent about talking about themselves. But since we're all, all eat, it doesn't feel as self-involved or selfish to say, this is what my mom made. This is what my father made. This is what I ate when I went to visit my family. It doesn't feel like you're talking about yourself. Um, but you are, and it's an opportunity to do so, and that's not a bad thing. It's a, it's a connection at a different level. I think it's, um, it's, it's um, permission, basically, to explore your own history and then to ask other people questions that you might not otherwise ask in polite company, you know, but um, you can do it through the venue of talking about what they eat. Leslie, I think that we're up on our time. Um, uh, I, I wish that we had more time. We, they were, you have so many questions and the chat's going well and I have a million other questions, but thank you. Thank you so much to all four of you and to the Newburyport Literary Festival um, for keeping this um, going and having us talk about something besides COVID-19 right now. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> that is a really nice break. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See everybody. Bye. Thank you.